Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the High Energy Density Science Center seminar series. Uh, today, I'm pleased to welcome Dr. Sebastian Merkel, who is an expert on high pressure mineral physics. He is a professor at the University in France and the president for mineral and rock physics at the American Geophysical Union. Dr. Merkel was originally scheduled to give the seminar one year ago tomorrow. Uh, but we had to cancel due to the pandemic and this was the first seminar to be affected and i am happy to be able to invite him back in this virtual forum and hope it will be less than another year that we will be able to have him and other speakers here in person dr mckell moved to 2006 and was promoted to a professor in 2010 before moving to Lille, he was a postdoctoral fellow at uc berkeley and the university of tokyo in japan he did his PhD between the Carnegie Institute in Washington, D.C. and the École Normale Supérieure de Lyon in France. His research focuses on understanding the dynamics and formation of the deeper portions of the Earth. He performs experiments under the pressure and temperatures of the Earth's interior to study Earth st structures and polycrystals, their mechanical behavior, and their relation to phase transformations and wave propagation through these complex microstructures. This work aims at understanding the dynamics and formation of the Earth's mantle and inner core. So I'd like to inform everybody that this uh, talk will be recorded. Comfortable with that, please log off. And also it's open uh, to external researchers and it's of course an unclassified talk. Uh, so please be aware. Um, otherwise, I'm looking forward to listening to it and uh, please take it away, Dr. Mikhail. Okay, well, thank you for the uh, introduction. And in fact, yes, I was supposed to give a talk last year, almost a year ago. Um, I think maybe even exactly a year ago. Uh, I can't tell everything. Yeah, a year ago tomorrow. <clears throat> a year ago tomorrow, yeah. And then I, I flew out of the US. I was going to finish. The talk. I was uh, escaping, <laughs> going home. Um, so, yeah, I was. So thank you for the invitation to give this talk a year later. So good morning, good evening here. And so I'll be speaking about my exp what we do here under high pressure to study microstructures of materials. So uh, I, I hope everything will go well. If anything, you know, the slides or the sound try to flag me down, I hope I will see it. And uh, so <clears throat> What are materials microstructures? Well, materials microstructures, they are the arrangements of elements inside a material, distribution of phases, grain sizes, grain orientations, grain boundaries, and etc. And they are relevant for multiple material properties, and in particular for the rheology uh, of materials, for mechanical properties, strengths, wave propagation, elastic and isotropy. And, and, and many more. And I put a few examples of what material, uh, microstructures look like. Uh, you know, like this is what microstructures look like in a polycrystalline olivine, a mineral for the deepers, uh, or in metals as well. It's a very common field of study. Now, why do I, as a geophysicist, care about microstructures? Is one application is, for instance, we have uh, an isotropy of propagation of seismic waves. Uh, seismic wave uh, in the inner core of the Earth travel faster if they go north to south than if they go east to west. And where is this coming from? Uh, can it tell us something about the what's happening inside the inner core or about its history, how it was formed, how old is it? Because uh, it's, it's one of the few tools we have to observe such deep regions inside the Earth. This is why it's so important to geo geophysicists. Now, if you look at the microscopic scale, why do we have an isotropy uh, of propagation of waves? It's because you know minerals are anisotropic uh, in terms of elasticity. You'll get an isotropy in the wave propagation depending on their elastic properties, and most minerals are anisotropic. Uh, but if they are randomly aligned in a polycrystal, then you won't get any form of anisotropy. On the other hand, if you have a texture, if you have lattice preferred orientation, then you'll get anisotropy again. And uh, and this depends, uh, the anisotropy you get depends on the single crystal properties, on the elastic constants, but also on the microstructures. Uh, 
uh, hence the importance of looking at microstructures for the deep earth. Uh, and these microstructures can arise from deformation, phase transformations, multiple processes. Uh, as an illustration, for instance, a few years ago, we did a model of inner core and isotropy, uh, like we try to model a formation of the inner core, so we built a geodynamical model of the inner core growing over time, over a billion years, and calculated the strains inside the inner core, and then, you know, we actually applied mechanical properties and microstructure developments based on what we know about the deformation of iron under those conditions and then try to then build a model of the core as it is today. And we propagated model through this virtual inner core that we had built uh, to try to simulate, to do a forward model of the uh, observations of anisotropy with the idea of comparing it to the true data. And, and the key questions in terms of uh, high pressure uh, physics or mineral physics is what, what, what is driving the evolution of microstructures? Uh, what is the effect of plastic flow? What is the effect of phase transformations? Uh, and how, you know, how does that depend on the material and pressure and temperature conditions? So I'm geophysicist mostly, so the type of pressure and temperatures I will be interested in are those of the Earth's mantle and core. So at the core mantle boundary, we are talking of, so we are 2,900 kilometers deep, and we're talking of pressures of 135 GPA, 3,000 Kelvin. Uh, at the center of the Earth, uh, we are at the depth of 6,300 uh, 6, kilometers, nearly 6,400, and pressures are on the order of 360 gigapascals temperatures on the order of 6,000 Kelvin. So this is the type of pressure temperature range that will be relevant for deep Earth geophysics. I studied that experimentally. Uh, I guess a lot of people on the, on the call here probably know what is a high pressure experiment in the laser heated diamond anvil cell. So I do a lot of my work in the laser heated diamond anvil cell, oops, sorry. In the laser heated diamond anvil cell, so where we can reach the pressures of the center of the earth by compressing samples between two gem diamonds. Uh, just the only problem is that samples are small, but apart from that we can. And then by focusing infrared lasers, we can actually reach temperature in Kelvins. Um, I also perform experiments using multi-envelope presses, large volume presses. This is an example of the large volume press at ESRF, the European, European synchrotron at ID6, uh, where uh, the pressures we can reach are not as high, but the advantage of advantages of using a multi-anvil press is we can use much bigger samples. This is a sample assembly which goes inside the press. The sample are mean. We can also control the pressure, the temperature, but also deformation much better than in the diamond anvil cell. Uh, but then the pressures you can get with that press are maybe on the order of maybe 20 GPA if you push it hard. And uh, I've also performed some laser-driven compression experiments. Uh, I'm giving a talk a few more here, so I guess most of you know about that, where we can you know, reach very high pressures, temperatures by focusing high power lasers to uh, polymer on the back of a sample that will, you know, then, and then that will generate a, shockwave or various type of compressions inside the sample uh, and then reach uh, pressures, temperatures which are actually well above those of the uh, Earth's interior. Something I like to focus when I give presentations in general is how important it is to couple those facilities, those, those techniques with large scale facilities. Uh, like for static experiments, we perform experiments at synchrotrons, uh, at the ESRF, the European synchrotron, for instance, uh, the Soleil synchrotron outside Paris. Uh, we can also use free electron lasers, and these dedicated beamlines on large scale facilities are really key to this research because they offer intense and very high power x-ray sources and they are very well suited for high pressure high temperature experiments with dedicated setup which are in place and aligned and this is what allows us to do actually a lot of the good science in the field of high pressure research it's not the only way but it is a very important way and i like to focus on that because 
large scale facilities are expensive, but this is the this where the science gets done. And uh, we do measurements using X ray diffraction, radiography, tomography, exas, spectroscopy, many types of science and measurements. So now that I've introduce the topic. I, uh, so I told you I was going to speak about microstructures, which is what we focus on. And I was going to give you two examples of the work we do here in Lille and with collaborations, actually, you'll see later. Um, and the first will be on static experiments, where I'll be looking at microstructures induced by phase transformation. So I'll look at deep earth oxides and how uh, the uh, transformations can affect grain orientation, grain sizes, and the geophysical implications. And then I, I thought, since we have results, it would be interesting to speak to this audience about stress and texture in shock compressed uh, iron, which uh, we've uh, done uh, experiments on at uh, Slack uh, a few years ago. So transformation microstructures, it's a project I have uh, had, I've been working on for several years. And at the moment, we have a large grant between France and Germany with several PhD students to work on this. And, uh, and so the idea is to look at transformations in oxides and what is the effect on grain size, grain orientations, and how relevant is it for the earth mantle. For instance, uh, we have this transition between perovskite and post perovskite. Uh, so the perovskite is a dominant mineral in the lower mantle. Uh, the post perovskite is, uh, we think, dominant in uh, the double prime layer just above the core mantle boundary. And uh, it's one of the most important phase transformations when you look at the Earth's mantle. And uh, it's been, it was discovered in 2004 and has been driving uh, research uh, since, so for the last 15 years. And uh, uh, every, this is what people have suggested on how this transformation can be happening. The first simulations of Takutsuchiya, for instance, in 2004, so he suggests like there is a distortion of the perovskite lattice that will lead into the post-perovskite phase. And then Artem Organov made models where he was, as, and he had this complex metadynamics model where stacking folds will be moving through the material and give you, allow you to go from this perovskite phase to this post perovskite phase. Uh, and, uh, but then uh, later there were experiments on analogs in a in IF3, uh, where as they've been looking at electron microscopy uh, and found orientation relationships between perovskite and post perovskite. Now, if you look in details about these mechanisms that have been suggested, they are actually different in the way the crystals will be oriented relative to each other. With the first mechanism, you get a 45 degrees rotation around the C-axis to go from a perovskite to a post-perovskite. With the second mechanism, it's pretty much random. It's a random rotation around the C-axis. Uh, with the model of David Dobson in 2013, it's a 16.7 rotation around the C-axis. So those are different. And actually, do they even apply in, in polycrystals is, is one of the questions. Now, why do we care? Uh, it's important in, in geosciences. In ge whoop, sorry. Uh, it's important in geophysics uh, because the um, the uh, we think it, it, it will be relevant for the D double prime layer. Whoops, let me go back. Um, where imagine if you have a slab that's arriving at the core mental boundary, you'll have this transformation between perovskite and post perovskite. And the question is, what's you know, are you keeping a memory of the microstructure? So, are you keeping a memory of the texture uh, when you go to the post perovskite phase? And what does that do on the seismic measurements that we do down there? Or, uh, or are we resetting everything? Do we get a full reset? Is the material uh, after the perovskite to post perovskite transformation just clean of the history of what was happening before. So if I look at the details of these mechanisms of David Dobson, for instance, so you this is how he suggests you, you make a post perovskite out of a perovskite. So this is a perovskite in green and post perovskite in red. And so you can out of each uh, orientation, parent orientation of perovskite, you can to have two daughter orientations of post perovskite, uh, and each have a, you know, 16.75 degrees rotation relative to perovskite. And now, you know, does that, 
does it go between those two variants, those two dollar phases? Uh, which one is going to grow? Are you going to have one of the two or the two of them? This type of questions we want to answer. To approach this problem, we use multigrain crystallography. Uh, multigrain crystallography uh, is kind of a new technique. Uh, it's, and, and the idea is to, to step scan a diamond anvil cell in front of the uh, X-ray beam. So instead of collecting data with your diamond anvil cells, the X-ray beam and just you know shooting X-ray diffraction data, you you step scanning like, like you will do it with a single crystal, but you save every images, uh, and you we typically rotate over 45 degrees and collect data every 0 0.5 degrees. That gives you 90 diffraction patterns per uh, PT point, and then uh, you look at the spots. So it's all the spots you get because your samples as grains and it's very spotty. It's common in diamond cell experiment that the Diffraction images are spotty, uh, but here we actually extract them one by one, uh, and so we get a database of spots we measure as a function of uh, angles. So this eta angle, uh, azimuthal angle on the detector to theta diffraction angle and the omega rotation at which we saw the diffraction spots. To get to that type of information, the idea, the, the way you do it is you have these um, uh, images you acquired at every step in the rotation. Uh, and you can, for each pixel on the detector, you can calculate the median value of the diffraction intensity that you measured. And you get this median image, uh, which uh, the median image actually uh, the, this has the effect of keeping the background, the powder, but the spots are removed from that image. And if you subtract the median image from the diffraction image, then the spots go, show up very easily. Uh, you, you completely get rid of the diamond cell background, uh, the diamond diffusion and the powder signal and whatever is on the way is completely gone. You only keep the spots, the bigger grains in the sample. And then it's just a high pass filter to locate all the spots and, and, and those peaks. You, uh, based on those images, you can actually even uh, get a first set of information uh, because the average of all of those diffraction images include the signal from everything, large grains, background, small grains, whereas the median image includes background, small grains, but not the large grains. And so uh, this tells you an idea, but it tells you something about your sample and, and, in, and if you do a two theta, uh, uh, an integration of that image and plot the intensity versus two theta, uh, uh, the, uh, the ratio between the two sets of intensities you will get tells you how much of your sample is in the form of grains and how much of your sample is in the form of a fine powder, which you can't see. Now, how do we do that when we typical capabilities? We are working with about 10,000 diffraction spots per pressure. Uh, and then we do uh, random walks through orientation space to locate the grain. So we do typically a million uh, trials. Uh, and that allows us to index on the order of 500 grains, uh, sometimes less, sometimes more uh, at each pressure. And then for each grain, we get ideas on their orientation, their cell parameters, their relative volume. Uh, we've already published quite a few papers on this. Uh, the references are here. Uh, but also, um, since we have these grants which, in which we're training many students, we, we actually, I mean, four, three, sorry. We, uh, we, we, uh, we wrote a wiki for all those, those students as we were training them. And so it's now available online. and it, you know, tells us you how we do this data, this type of data analysis. If you are interested, I also wanted to say that there is a working, uh, there is a project of having a working group at the International Union of Crystallography, which will be called Diffraction Microstructure Imaging. As a project will be sent pretty soon, actually, and so we hope this will be part of the International Union of Crystallography soon. Not only for high pressure, for for many fields in material science. So I'm going to show some illustrations with uh, going from a perovskite to a post-perovskite phase. I'm not going to look at the true phase in the deep mantle because it's at the moment outside our reach for this type of experiments. Uh, here we, we worked on this cobalt analog because the pressure and temperatures you can reach with a resistively heated diamond anvil cell. Uh, 
Uh, and so what we did is we heated the sample to 900 Kelvin, compressed it to in the perovskite field, converted it to post perovskite, and then we look at the grains in perovskite before transformation, then look at the grains in post perovskite after transformation. And then we're going to go back from post perovskite to perovskite. So what I'm going to show now are, are the statistics of grain orientations uh, that we measure uh, in uh, perovskite at, uh, before the transformation and then in post-perovskite after the transformation as we increase pressure from 14 GPA to 17 GPA. So when we look at perovskite, we were able to index uh, 1,000 grains, 1,100 grains. And what is plotted below, it's the projections of the grain orientations with the diamond cell direction is on the side here. If you don't know how to read the pole figures, it's okay. What matters is each point here on this figure is a grain and the, where it is located on the figure tells you about the grain orientation. Uh, and so we are following the orientation of a thousand grains inside the sample. Now, as we go to post-perovskite, we can perform the same exercise. And so we are th through 3 GPA higher, and we perform an indexing of our diffraction data using post-perovskite. And now uh, you can see that uh, we have now uh, 800 grains, and we have their orientation distribution. We, for each grain, we know where uh, where they are. I mean, we know they are in their space in the, sorry, where they are in orientation space. And uh, when we started the project, I wanted to be able to say, oh, one grain here, this guy uh, in perovskite is becoming this guy over here in post-perovskite. Uh, and uh, as a matter of fact, it doesn't work. We don't have enough uh, orientation resolution for that, but we can look at it uh, and you know, pick features. So for instance, uh, the first thing we can see when we compare those two distributions is that the number of grains is multiplied by a factor of two and a half. Uh, when we look at the orientations in, uh, of O1 uh, planes, uh, well, they, they are pretty much matching between O1 of perovskite and O1 of post-perovskite. And if you remember the mechanism that were suggested, it was a rotation around 0, 0, 001, so it makes sense and it's compatible with those mechanisms. Now, uh, if we look more carefully, it's not as easy to see, but the orientations of 1.0 in perovskite are not so far from the orientations at of 1.0 in post-perovskite. And that matches what David Dobson suggested, not the other two. Uh, if you had the Tsuchiya model, it would rotate by 45 degrees. If you had the Oganov model, it will be random. Uh, and so it's, it, it actually goes in favor of the Dobson model. You can go a little bit further than that is, you know, you can actually simulate it. You know the orientation relationship. So you can say for each grain of perovskite, I know this perovskite is going to have two daughters and these daughters are going to be with this orientation. Uh, and so if you do that, uh, perform this simulation, uh, you can, this is a simulated pattern. So this is a simulated grain orientation and over here is a simile, is a measured grain orientation. In, in, the, in the experiment. And there's a pretty good match. I mean, it's not perfect, but some features are, are the same. And if you look more carefully, uh, we have 2,200 grains in the simulation. We have 2,800 grains in the experiment. And so those grains have been coming from somewhere. Uh, and uh, I think they've been nucleating randomly from the patterns that's floating around the sample. Uh, and uh, and if you add 641 nine grains, which are the missing grains, uh, if you do just the counting, uh, you add them randomly uh, into your simulation. This is the simulation. This is the data. So it's, there is a very very good match between the data and the simulation on the mechanism of trans and 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 so it's very consistent with the mechanism of transformation between perovskite and post perovskite that was suggested by David Dobson. Uh, you can uh, also extract grain size distributions based on these measurements. I won't go into the detail, actually, just so you can do it. Uh, now, what I, I want to see is what happens uh, if you go back, if you go from post-perovskite to perovskite. Is it the same mechanism or is it different? So now we're going to go from a perovskite, post-perovskite at 18 GPA, and we're going to lower the pressure to 13 GPA.
And this is the results. You go from a thousand grains of prosperoskite at 18 GPA. And as you go down, you go to 300 grains, 300 orientations actually in perovskite. And if you look at those 300 orientations in perovskite, they actually are very concentrated around one specific orientation for 001 and two orientations for 010 and 100. So, and, 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 and if you look uh, in this gold figure and look at the rotations to go from one to the other, you realize that to go from here to there, uh, it's an 86 degrees rotation around the C axis, which actually happens to be a twinning mode in perovskite. So what I think we're forming when we go back to perovskite, we're not forming many, many grains of perovskite, we're actually forming one big grain with many twin domains. I don't know why, but it's very different from when you go up in pressure. When you go up, it's actually a martensitic transformation with orientation relationships. When you go down, it's a diffusive transformation with complete reconstruction of the microstructure. The take home messages yeah, uh, from that experiment is that if you go from perovskite to post perovskite in NSE or E3, well, you get an uh, Dobson like uh, mechanism with orientation memory. It's a martensitic Martin like transformation uh, with a division of grain sizes by two. Uh, and then uh, if you go back to perovskite from post perovskite in this compound NSE or E3, uh, the grain size gets multiplied by a factor of 10. Uh, and uh, and uh, you lose the orientation memory, so you don't have any memory of uh, of, of the orientation before. The, the, in, in, the, in the figure here, the, the crystals of perovskite that we are growing don't have any specific orientation relative to the experiment, orientation relative to the starting material. It's just one orientation that just started the transformation and then took over, I believe. Uh, now, if I um, so, what are the consequences of that? Like, if you are talking in in, in terms of geosciences, in in terms of geosciences, well, you know, like you imagine you are for done wedding slab that goes down in the lower mid, you'll have deformation of your perovskite uh, polycrystal through dislocation glide, dislocation climb, diffusion, whatever. You'll be building a microstructure in perovskite as your material is going down in the earth's mantle. As you make post-perovskite, you'll get a transformation to post-perovskite, and you will keep a memory of the microstructure in perovskite. It will be changed, but there'll be a memory, and the grain by two. Then, as your material is going down along the core mantle boundary, uh, you uh, will have changes in grain orientation through plastic deformation, through motion of dislocations or whatever, uh, maybe grain growth, uh, and develop a new type of anisotropy, a new type of texture, new type of microstructures. But then, when you'll be reaching a region of high temperature where you transform back to perovskite, you will lose the memory of all of that and you'll and clean material. It'll be fresh, it'll be clean, and actually, apparently, from the experiment, you even get a grain size multiplication by a factor, uh, which is quite significant. Then, perovskite will be driven up in the Earth's mantle, and again, deforms through dislocation, climb, glide, or whatever mechanism it wants to deform, uh, and, and developing its microstructures. So this is one application. Uh, but as you saw, we were working, so it's a, it's a very interesting results, but we were limited in, in, in the pressure and temperature range. We couldn't work on the true perovskite, post-perovskite that we, uh, we uh, wanted to, that would be relevant, that would be the one you find in the earth's mantle. Uh, for that, you need laser heating, and you need to be able to rotate your diamond and bell cell uh, in front of the X-ray beam while collecting X-ray diffraction. And it's actually possible now. I mean, it was before the yeah, ESRF went for repairs, just installed it at ID27. They just installed a system like that, and we're lucky enough to use it. So this is a drawing. This is a picture of the system. So the X-rays here are in green. 
the detector is to the back, uh, the beam is coming from the front, and the sample, the sample dominant vessel will be sitting here, and this is a laser heating system uh, that is uh, shown in red, and it's being held by two huge arms, which you can't see on the picture, but below there is a rotation stage, and you can actually rotate that whole thing in front of the x-rays. So I had a movie, but it wasn't playing very well, so I took screenshots. And so this is our diamond and bell cell on this la rotating laser heating setup at ESRF that we measured just before they closed uh, two years ago. Uh, and so you, yeah, the laser, this is a laser heating system uh, and the diamond and bell cell. This is our 2D detector and the beam is coming from the back. And then we can actually rotate the diamond cell while laser heating. So we can actually collect this type of step scan data while laser heating and while maintaining the sample at a relatively constant temperature. So as the first uh, uh, applications, we looked at the uh, at what's happening in olivine and wadsleyite, uh, which are relevant for the Earth's upper mantle and transition zone. And so here, what we are looking at, it's just a sample of the results. It's the ongoing work of SL Ledoux. She's working on her. She's finishing up right now. Uh, where, you know, we, we look at olivine uh, at 1700 Kelvin, 21 GPA. And then we increase pressure on the sample uh, and transform to Wadsleyite while keeping laser heating. Uh, pressure goes down due to the phase transformation. And then we keep increasing pressure uh, to 18 GPA, 19 GPA. And all along the way, we keep the sample at a 1700 Kelvin. And we, at each step in pressure, we stop the pressure increase, collect multigrain diffraction, and, and then go on and go again. And so the difference between the, the, the previous type of experiment and this one is the temperature. We actually can work at several thousands of degrees uh, and stay there for hours. Uh, we've actually been able to do such experiments over um, over like 20 hours or so. Uh, and so then we can follow grain orientations in olivine and wadsleyite. What's plotted here is inverse pole figure. And again, the dots tell you something about grain orientations. So here, uh, uh, I won't tell you the whole story to walk you through the whole story. But uh, in this case, the transformation is reconstructive. We don't have orientation memory between olivine and wadsleyite. And then as we compress wadsleyite, we see the development of lattice peripheral orientation, development of texture, which we can then correlate to slip systems and deformation. So this is what I had prepared for uh, microstructures induced by phase transformations. And then, uh, so I will switch to a slightly different topic, which uh, I thought would be of interest to you, uh, to this audience uh, in Livermore, uh, where we look at texture and stress in shock compress at CPI. So it's a completely different project. Work we've done with Ariana Gleason in Stanford and Slack and uh, many people in Stanford, Los Alamos and uh, UC Berkeley. And actually, for the short story, this is why I was in Stanford last year, just before the lockdown. I was working on this data. Uh, so we are using laser-driven compression at the Slack beamline. Uh, the idea uh, is we have an iron sample. We drive the lasers of the Slack beamline, the MEC beamline, sorry, MEC beamline at Slack uh, to uh, red to reach high pressure, high temperature. Uh, in HCP iron. So in our case, we'll just be following the Higonia. We didn't do anything complicated like go on to isentropes or anything like that. Uh, and so we had a, we did the experiment at Slack on the MEC beamline. Uh, we had the sample holders and its many targets, so we could repeat the experiment. What was uh, the, the thing that was different in this experiment was the layout of the detectors. The detectors were laid out in a way that we could get maximum coverage of orientation for texture and stress analysis. So uh, Cindy Bolmer actually and Ariana had thought very hard on how to place all of those small detectors and large detectors around the sample uh, so we could get an idea of stress and st stress and texture. Uh, and then the um, the FEL beam uh, was launched at 65 degrees relative to the shock direction to allow something that looks like what we call radial diffraction, for instance, in diamond and cell data. 
and this is why I was called in uh, this for my ability to process this type of data. Um, so we have four uh, pressure and temperature ranges in this uh, set of experiments. Uh, I will be mostly speaking of this one here where we have results at one nearly two megabars and 4,000 Kelvin. And, uh, and then we also have uh, results in the lower pressure range between 20 and, and 55 GPA. Uh, the idea is, is uh, this is a type of measurement um, we do in static experiment to look at stress and textures in polycrystals. These are measurements in a large volume press on zinc. Uh, you collect 2D X-ray diffraction and with a specific geometry where you can actually see the effect of stress uh, and as you uh, compress the material, uh, if you put stress, the, the, the by rings will be distorted and will become like ellipses. And as your grains rotate, you'll develop textures, lattice peripheral orientation, and that will show up as variations of diffraction intensity. It's not easy to see on such a figure, but if you look at the integration as a function of azimuthal angles, is delta or eta angle, depending on convention, then it's easier to see. And this is the same diffraction pattern plotted with two theta in horizontal, the azimuthal angle here. Uh, so you are turning around the diffraction rings when you move up, when you move up, sorry, I was pointing on the wrong screen, when you move up on the, uh, uh, on the vertical direction, uh, you see variation of diffraction intensities with orientation, that is texture. You see variations of peak positions with orientation, which is strain, and from which you can try to invert stresses. So it's very commonly used in static experiments. The idea is to do that on the shock. So this is the type of X-ray diffraction data we managed to collect and reconstruct based on uh, at the MEC beam line. Uh, so this is an example. Uh, it's HCP iron at 193 GPA for 4,000 Kelvin based on the uh, unit cell volume. Uh, this on top is the uh, um, the bottom is the data on top is the is the reconstruction, uh, and uh, you can see diffractions from the ambient pressure BCC which has not been reached by the shock yet, and then of the high pressure HCP phase. Uh, the data looks very noisy uh, and 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 very. Um, the coverage is not complete, far from it. But we're lucky that, you know, we can assume that there is some form of axial symmetry around the shock direction, uh, uh, and which allows us to make a lot of assumptions on how the stress and the texture should look like. Uh, and then HCP materials have a lot of redundancy, so you don't need so many peaks to get some data. Uh, and then you can get the fit of unit cell parameters Lally strains, which is the effect of stress, uh, the way peaks move with orientation, this is stress, and the variation of peak intensities with orientation, it's texture. So here are the results for HCP iron. So on the left, you have a simulation with the pressure as a function of time. The time is vertical in this figure. And uh, the sample of iron is here, color is pressure up to two megabar. Uh, a put time equals zero when we see HCP. Uh, and this is the X-ray diffraction measurement evaluation of stress and texture. So here we're plotting uh, stress here as a function of time. The dots are the points where we actually measured X-ray diffraction data and the blue is just a guide. And then texture that we uh, measure in the sample. Uh, I will uh, focus on the texture a little bit. <clears throat> so 0 0.59 seconds after transformation, nanoseconds, sorry, after transformation, we get a texture with a maximum at 2 minus minus 1 oh. And then as you move, as the shock front is moving through the sample, the texture switches to 30 degrees away from 0, 0, 001. I have drawings here. So if you're not very comfortable with this texture, this is how what happens. When you form HCP ion uh, during, uh, from BCC in the shock, you get a texture, grain orientations with the C-axis are perpendicular to the shock direction. And then as you, the shock is moving through the sample, uh, the grains are rotating and they rotate to an orientation where the C-axis are rotated 30 degrees away from 
the compression direction from the shock. Um, now, how does that, uh, what, what, what is the reason for that? So we can try to do modeling of texture evolution. It's something we do very commonly for HCP metals. So this is the VPSC simulation. So we'll go viscoplastic self-consistence where I can, I can, I can force a deformation mechanism to take over the plasticity and grain orientations. Uh, and this is the result. So this is the type of textures we measured in the experiment as a function of time, as the shock is moving through the material. And this is the experiment, the simulation results. So here is the starting texture in the simulation is the experimental texture after transformation. If I run a simulation as saying that texture is due to basal slip, uh, this is what I get. Uh, if I run a simulation saying dominant, uh, prismatic slip is dominating grain orientation. So this is what I get. If I say it's pyramidal C plus A, this is what I get. And if I actually assume that the dominant deformation mechanism is twinning, uh, this specific type of twinning, which is common in the CP metal, one or minus one, two, uh, then I get something which actually is really close to what we see in the experiment. So what's happening when we go from a texture at 2 minus minus 1 oh, to this one, 30 degrees away from compression with, from C, is uh, uh, the grains are, are twinning. The grains are twinning under the effect of shock, under the effect of plasticity. Uh, you get grain, grain orientation through twinning. Then later in, in the shock, we get uh, an increase again of the starting texture. And it's just due to the shock that's moving through the sample. And there's new grains of HCP being generated, and they are generating with a starting texture, and then they slowly twin. Now, if I focus on the stress <coughs> curve, so I've, I've zoomed in on the stress curve, which I showed you earlier. This is the time in nanoseconds in horizontal stress in HCP iron that we deduce from uh, X-ray diffraction. And uh, this is how it looks like. And we actually were quite puzzled about that. That's not what I, what I expected. And uh, now this is how I interpret it. So this is my interpretation. Uh, it's a bit busy, sorry. <laughs> uh, so I think what's happening is as the shock is coming into the sample, you get a big increase of stress, of elastic stresses, uh, until you get enough defects to be generated uh, to activate plastic flow, plastic deformation. And then so you get a transition from elastic to plastic behavior at the yield strength, uh, 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 which, and then plastic relaxation through 1 0 minus 1 0 twi minus 1 2 twinning. Uh, and then, as you activate plasticity, the crystal, the polycrystal can relax stresses, and so it goes down. And it goes down to uh, uh, something at the long term, what I call the long term flow stress. Uh, which uh, which is much lower than the peak uh, stress at the onset of plasticity, uh, and our values of stress are not so high. Uh, you know, the, the the peak stress we we didn't measure, unfortunately, um, didn't know this was going to happen. Um, but uh, but uh, it's probably quite high. Uh, but then actually, it's quite surprising that we get very low stress values on the order of five GPA, two to five GPA later in the compression. Uh, this was modeled. I mean, there is our prediction that the stress curve should believe and behave that way. And I think I saw Nathan Barton's name on the list of uh, people, and, and he has papers with curves like this one. Um, I don't think it was measured. So uh, now uh, it's, it didn't happen in every experiment. Some experiments we have a smooth increase of stress versus time. Uh, and then when we have a smooth increase of stress versus time, it goes up to maybe 10 GPA and then the shock is released. Uh, uh, we couldn't maintain it for longer. Uh, and and in the, when, when, the, when the stress goes up and doesn't get extra evolution. So it confirms that I think what I think is that when, you know, we get this peak, this increase, uh, elastic increase of stresses, uh, and then once you have plastic flow, twinning, dislocations, whatever, you relax. So it, it, it asks us, you know, what is the strength of iron uh, uh, under high pressure, under shock conditions, under static conditions? And it's kind of a summary figure of the strengths of iron that has been reported. Uh, you have the curves from uh, diamond cell experiments uh, here. 
uh, which are quite low. And then you have this measurement of Bing et al. in, in, in 2013 from, from, from Livermore, uh, where the, I, I want to point out that it's an estimate of stress, which is based on temperature uh, uh, measurements. It's not a measurement of stress, it's a measurement of temperature increase, and then it's a, it's a model of plastic heating to reinvert the stress. And then our data points, the stress values we measured, uh, which plot closer to what was measured in static experiments. Now, as I said, uh, we, you know, maybe the peak stress at the onset of plastic flow is higher than what we measure, but a few nanoseconds later, this is where we are. So, uh, in terms of plasticity of shop compressed HCP iron, uh, the, we managed to perform in situ X-ray diffraction measurement of stress of lattice preferred orientation during laser driven shock compression and look at those uh, the time dependence of stress and time dependence of microstructures. Uh, one limitation is we are shooting X-rays through the whole sample. We're not looking exactly at the shock front. We're looking at the average properties, but still, uh, with observations of a big elastic overshoot prior to the elastic to plastic transition, uh, stress relaxation with plastic flow, which we see in some experiments, uh, which is driven by one or minus one or minus one two twins, and it happens in less than a second, length less than a nanosecond when it starts. Uh, conclusions. Uh, yes, as it was said in the introduction, I, I, I was supposed to give a talk on March 12, 2020. Uh, this is the last email, uh, one of the last emails about it. But then, uh, you know, this happened. Uh, Donald Trump closed the border between uh, US and Europe. So I actually escaped from Stanford on March 12, 2020. It just flew back to France and I didn't expect I'd be locked in for a year after that escape. Uh, lucky I did escape in a way. Uh, and uh, I, uh, what I try to show you in this talk is how we use uh, multi-grain X-ray diffraction and we try to monitor single silicate grains, how they rotate and how what happens when you go through a phase transformation uh, inside a diamond anvil cell. You can also watch grains of HCP metals since are in polycrystals this time and how they build stress and texture in deformation experiments, static or dynamic. And then, you know, one side of my work is also to incorporate those into plasticity models uh, to understand the Earth and, and the evolution of the Earth's mental and core, for instance, which I didn't speak about today. Uh, and with this, I thank you for having listened to me and uh, I ready to take any question. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for the talk. Um, so I invite everybody to uh, enter any of your questions in the chat field and I will read them off for a speaker. And also, uh, please unmute yourself so we can give our speaker a nice round of applause. So, <laughs> there's a question from Jeff Colvin. Uh, what role does the geomagnetic field play in this downwelling slash upwelling process? Uh, probably not much. Uh, it's, it's, it's more, uh, it's, a, it's a release of heat uh, that uh, so the, the earth is being heated through um, radioactive decay and it's a release of heat. And uh, Jill Bernier had, had a question. Uh, did you want to unmute yourself? Hey, Sebastian. Hello. Uh, I got a question about your uh, kind of a technical question about the stress analysis from the LCLS data. Yeah. Uh, is that are, are the stre stresses that you're calculating coming from uh, ISO strain approach coming from the measured uh, powder diffraction strains? Kind of. Yeah. It's it's the ty typical residual stress analysis. You know that you can do on X-ray diffraction data. There's not no complex model of any form. Oh, like sine squared sine or the uh, yeah 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 sine square that is sine sine squared oh yeah okay that answers my question and there's a question from uh, new Saranch. says the ten to twelve twinning mode in HCP is extension twin what it is getting activated or why do you think it's getting activated during compression. Uh, 
So it is true that um, uh, 1 0 minus 1 2 twinning is an extension twin in HCP ion. It depends on the C over A ratio. Uh, but um, it uh, it means it when we when we say extension twin, it's, ex it's extension of the C axis. And uh, as you uh, actually the figure is projected here, uh, as the shock is coming through the sample, the C axis is perpendicular to shock, and it's actually under extension. <laughs> and so you activate an extension twin. And there's a question from John Eggert. Uh, it says, "Excellent talk." Can you explain the experimental differences or corrections for when you see the stress drop due to twinning versus when you do not overcome the yield strength barrier and the stress rises smoothly? So I, um, we, we have out of the four experiments, four type, four, four conditions. We have two where we overcame the yield strength barrier and two where we did not. And so it's, I can tell you it's not a pressure. Uh, one set of experiments at 20 GPA, we did go over it. Uh, and, uh, and the other two are in between. So it's not, an, it's not because we were at low pressure versus high pressure. I, I am not exactly sure. I think it's just the stress in, in those runs did not reach uh, values that were high enough to, uh, to activate plastic flow. Now, why did one run uh, reach a high stress and the other one not? I'm not sure. And there's also a question from Ivan Olyanik. Mm -hmm. There's some debate whether HCP phase of iron stable phase at strong shock conditions at pressures of the Earth's core. Is there any signatures of BCC phase in your XRD crushed crystal? And uh, no, we did not. See... Yeah. And, and it just yeah. also part asked uh, how well constrained were the grain positions in strain? So in um... Uh, the first questions on HCP on iron, we did not see any evidence of BCC iron on the diffraction data. It's HCP everywhere. Uh, we see a BCC on release, actually sometimes FCC, sometimes BCC, but I don't see any uh, high pressure BCC. It's really ICP, a, a HCP. Now, uh, for the question of Chase, uh, he... Uh, Yes, I apologize. I mixed the question. Yeah, second question yeah, that I mean, appeared right. I was reading it. How, and I got... <laughs> well so he's talking of multigrain crystallography, and he's asking me uh, for the measurements I had on uh, NaCoF3. Uh, how well do I constrain the grain positions and strain? Uh, well, not well actually. <laughs> we for, for that experiment, we we don't have a good resolution on grain positions. With the new ones, the laser heating experiment, we have actually when we try to invert with fetal bees the grain positions, it's it seems very consistent. The strain tensors, I'm not sure. Uh, for this experiment uh, with resistive heating, no, we don't get a good position. As uh, Yes, so Chase wanted to speak in person. You, you can unmute yourself. Thank you. Um, hey, Sebastian, how's it going, man? Good. Uh, uh, quick, yeah, so, because, you know, when we've done these experiments in the past, we've I've usually started with a single crystal um, yeah. to minimize the number of what I'm looking at to try and yeah. help me expand some of these parameters. So do you think that that could be a function of, so do you, you started with, like, I think you told me before, right, like a, a very coarse crushed powder. Yeah. So you're yeah. starting with, a, do you think that that has any effect on that at all this is something I've, I've been wrestling with myself because some experiments i have a lot of grains i find my positions are less constrained but if i start with a single crystal they're usually very well constrained my, my, even if i don't use half a scan my guess was more uh, experimental uh, wobble okay. diamond cell okay okay you, know, you, you you as you step scan it especially this experiment on nsu3 we were doing resistive heating so there's a lot of cables mm -hmm. going to cell and i don't see you know, ah, yeah. the patient is probably not as good as we think uh and gotcha. so i i suspect it's more the wobbling uh, mm -hmm. when we do the laser heating experiment it seems to be much better okay yeah that, that's that's consistent with what i've seen too so i was just curious yeah, yeah. 
So I had a question. Um, so you you have yeah you know, on this more recent work slides slide uh, you were saying you didn't really get to talk about incorporating this into Earth's uh, dynamical models and yeah. predict its properties and evolution. Um, so this is basically like a, a multi-scale problem that it, your your research is on uh, studying the the microphysical properties of like different grains and um, phase changes. Could you speak more to how uh, this research impacts uh, like basically the hydrodynamic scale or how you go up to doing full like earth simulations? So usually uh, the way we do it is the uh, the global mantle flow or inner core flow. Uh, they, they are very simple model based on fluid dynamics with like a constant viscosity or something, something like that. Mm. And we use the flow from those geodynamics model uh, and we couple it with a viscoplastic self-consistent calculation to calculate the uh, microstructures. So it's not the microstructures that's driving the flow uh, or it's giving even constraint on viscosity. It's uh, we, we just put a, uh, you know, an ad hoc viscosity in this case. People have, have um, there are projects uh, here in Lille, actually there's a big group who do computations, uh, uh, plasticity computation. They try to go up the scales of, from dislocation to dislocation dynamics to this crystal, to polycrystal, to get to mechanical properties. But in my activity, I haven't done it. We go down uh, with, a, with a geodynamical model, which is purely the fluid dynamics. Uh, we get flow lines and then we incorporate those flow lines into polycrystal plasticity to get the microstructures. Thank you. Um, if there are no more questions, let's uh, thank our speaker again. Well, thank you for having me.